All right. Good lunch or good afternoon. Terve, as we say in Finland. Yeah. Welcome to my second lecture of quantitative finance. Uh, first of all, I would like to discuss with you a little something small that I that came up to my mind when I wrote, read an email and it was about uh, this MATLAB toolboxes. Yeah? And I, for those of you who have read the student guide that I wrote you, you might uh, remember that. So if we are in sports, yeah, and for instance, bicycle riders, yeah, or it's actually any, any sport you do, if it's skiing or, or whatever, first of all, you have to train on a low heart rate many hours, yeah? on a heart rate of 120, 110, 120, depending on your, on your age. So your peak performance is something like 220 minus your, your age. So if you are 20, then it's about 200 is your maximum heart rate. So this is where your peak, peak performance is. Yeah? If you have a race, for instance, or something, or bicycle riders, if they have a 100 or 100, 20 kilometers race, then they have a, like the maximum heart rate, like for an hour or something. But they train for that. And in order to be able to have this performance, you have to have a good fundament here. Yeah? So you, you cannot increase the pyramid like, like this. Yeah? You cannot increase the performance on the max heart rate without increasing the fundament. So this doesn't work out. So If you want to increase your performance on the maximum, yeah, and this is the starting point, so you have to increase the fundament. Yeah? You have to train any more, even more hours on a low heart rate in order to increase the maximum as well. Yeah? So you have to work on the fundament. If your fundament is already lacking, you will not be able to increase your performance on the top. It's obvious, right? Everybody knows that. It's, 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 it's nothing, nothing new, it's, it's, it's no secret. Yeah? And it's the same argument holds for everything, also in school. Uh, if you have no clue of anything and you start with using toolboxes in MATLAB, yeah, you, you, have, you have no clue what you do. You have no idea. You have, you, have, you have no idea what happens if some of the assumptions are violated. So you can use toolboxes. I mean, I have nothing against toolboxes once you have a good fundament here. Yeah? once you know what happens if things go wrong. Once you have established this fundament, you can use these toolboxes because then, then, you, then you know what they deliver you and, you and you know what happens if things go wrong. But first you have to establish your fundament. So that's why I do not use any toolbox in this course. And if you are very, very familiar with, with MATLAB at some point, after many, many hours of practicing, then at some point you might start to use the toolboxes instead of coding everything by, by yourself. Yeah. So last time we derived the OLS point estimator. Yeah. This is also a potential candidate for the exam. Yeah. That was the formula. And then in our case, we, we said, okay, why? is a vector of excess returns of a stock, and X is our regressor matrix that captures the, the uh, risk factors. Yeah? In the cap M case, this uh, X matrix, if we include an, inter an intercept term, this matrix looks like that. Yeah? We have the excess returns of the market factor in the second column. And in the first column, we have just a vector of ones. If we do not use an intercept term, if we say, yeah, the, the cap M works, we don't need the intercept term, then it's something like that. Yeah. But usually, we include an intercept term here as well. If we have the Farmer and French five-factor model and would include an intercept term, this matrix would be T by six. Right? This is a T by two matrix, and if we use the Hamann French six factor, uh, five factor model, then this would be a T by six matrix. Yeah. So in our CAPM case, this is T by two, 
yeah? T by 2 transpose is 2 by T times T by 2 is 2 by 2. So what we have here, this, this guy here is a 2 by 2 matrix times itself transposed, so it's 2 by T, and this is a T by 1 vector. So whatever we get out of here, our beta is, is always the column rank of our X matrix times 1. So in, in this case, it's, it's simply, it captures here the, the intercept term, the beta 0, or alpha, if you, if, if you want, depending on your notation, and the sensitivity against the market factor here. So if this is the Feynman, if the regressor matrix is the Feynman French 5 factor model, then this is t by 6. This guy here becomes 6 by 6. This is then 6 by t. This is t by 1. So what comes out here would be then 6 by 1, which gives us the point estimates against the risk factors as well as the intercept term in the first uh, row here. Yeah? So depending on your regressor matrix, the beta has a certain dimension. Yeah? Is this clear to everybody? That's like the basic stuff. Yeah. We know this already from econometrics one. So what's the expectation, what's the expected value of beta hat of our point estimator? So let's introduce the expectation operator, the expectation of beta head of our point estimator. So, it's the expectation of this uh, whole term here. So x transposed x inverted, so the regressor matrix times itself inverted times the regressor matrix transposed, times y. And now we can write, we can plug in for y what it is. y is x times our point estimator plus uh, error term. So this is what we plug in here for y. And now we can first multiply out what is in parentheses here. So we take the first guy here, the first term, multiply it with x times prime, with uh, x times beta, which is the real point estimate of our model. And the first guy here also times the random term u. So what we get then is the expectation from x prime x inverted times x prime x times beta. And because the expectation operator is a linear operator, it's a linear operator, yeah, so we can move it into the, into the parentheses. So plus the expectation from the first term times the error vector. So x prime x inverted times x prime u. Yeah? So now we have just solved it here. We have just plugged in the equation, our original equation, our linear regression model for the, for the y here, and then multiplied everything out, utilizing the fact that the expectation operator is a linear operator, and we can move it into the parentheses. So what do we have here? It's the same thing, just inverted here. It's, a, it's the same matrix product. So of course, what we have here is the identity matrix. And what, and what is left is the expectation from, beta, from our real point estimates. And the expectation from beta is beta. Because this is, this is, this, these are just numbers here. This, these are the real point estimates. Uh, so this is beta. The expectation of, of this term is just beta, our real point estimate. So, and what is left here? So what's random here? We discussed it last time. What's the random component here? X is not random, right? We say this is given. 
it's, it's strictly exogenous. Our, our stock returns are assumed to be the exogenous variable. So the only thing that is random here is our error term u. So we can move the expectation operator towards the error term and put this out of the parenthesis. So it's then this guy here times the expectation of our error vector u. And the expectation of our error vector u, according to our assumption, let's go back to our initial assumption here, if you don't remember. According to our assumptions, the last one here, or you can also take equation 5a, our u, our error, error term, is distributed as normal with expectation of zero and sigma squared the identity matrix as the covariance matrix. So what, what is here, the expectation of our error vector here is zero. Therefore, the expectation of our OLS point estimator is the real point estimate, right? So now we have proven that using OLS and our linear regression framework actually gives on expectation the real point estimates if our assumptions are satisfied. Any questions? Then last time, we are talking about the first exercise here, exercise three. So, and we are operating with a, a very simple model where we simply regress the excess returns of these stocks on the market factor in excess form. It's a very simple model. We don't even have an intercept here. It's a very simple model. And we are interested in the betas here. We want to, ha we want to know the sensitivities against the market factor. Yeah? And we want to store these betas here in a, in a result vector. So we want to store these betas and then we have a look on the distribution in our stock universe. Uh, we, want, we want to see the uh, betas of, of, of each stock. And then later on in the, in the next exercise we want to sort these betas. Uh, because imagine you are running an investment fund and you want to invest in let's say high beta stocks or low beta stocks. Then somehow you have to figure out which of these stocks have a high beta and which of those have a low beta. And if you have 10,000 stocks, you obviously you don't, you, you don't use EVUs. At least I wouldn't do it. Uh, because it takes like 10 years or something. So that's what we want to do and that's where we have stopped last time. Yeah? We are discussing a little bit about to organize the data and we finished by defining the number of stocks. K is 14. In our stock universe, we have a very small stock universe that we operate with. And uh, first of all, we were starting with defining our, our X, our regressor, which is uh, um, the the index return of the OMIX 30, which is the Swedish stock index, the Swedish leading stock index. We have also defined our data matrix here. So our Y, Y is the gross return matrix of our stocks that we have in our stock universe. Then we have defined the risk-free rate, which is the last column of, in our Excel file. Yeah. So the length of our data, of our data sample, we, I told you last time, we can also write length from, from x or length from rf because all these vectors have the same length. Yeah? If you just watch the Excel file, then, then you will see that all the observations stop at, 200, at t is 215. Or we could also just write, if we know that already beforehand, t is equal to 215. Yeah? That doesn't matter. 
So what we do in the first step here, what you see here, is we want to construct the matrix of excess returns. Yeah? Our Y, as we have defined it there in the original data matrix, our Y is given in gross returns. Yeah? Gross returns, but we want to have the excess returns because our as a pricing model or the cap M is defined for excess returns. So what we do first is we define a matrix and we and I have it here in this code. I defined it as Y1. You can choose, of course, and if you write your own code, you just have to know what it is, but you can of course write you everything. Uh, you can give it any any name. I keep it simple, it's just capital Y1, and I define it as zeros. So, so the command zeros, and in this case, T, T is 215, right? Do we remember? And K is 14. So what, what this command is doing is, it says, okay, give me a matrix that has 215 rows, I told you last time, the first index i is the row index, the second index j is the column index in this notation. So give me a matrix that has zeros everywhere, 215 rows and 14 columns. Yeah? And you remember now, okay, this, this is of course the same dimension as our y, as our gross return matrix. Yeah? Of course, it must be like that, yeah? because we just want to subtract the risk-free rate for each point in time for, and for each stock. So now we have here nothing else but a simple matrix that has zeros everywhere. Nothing more than that. So and what is then happening here? We have two for loops. Yeah? So now something is happening here. So the first for loop goes from J one to k and remember j is our column index so it means we start somewhere here this is j equal to one here we have j equal to two and so on yeah here the first element is when i is one and j is one this element here is when j is one and i is two so what happens here is it, it, it tells MATLAB to do something from the first column onwards, downwards. So it keeps J constant and then it, then it does something for I is one to T and T is 215. Because we have a 215 by 14 matrix, yeah? This is what, what happens here. So, and if J is one and I is one, it says, okay, the element IJ from matrix Y1, so now we are here, J is one and I is one, should be YIJ, so, and it's the same index. So it grabs now from the gross return matrix the first element, which is the gross return of stock one at time one, minus RF and RF, we know this, here's the risk-free rate stored, RF at time I. I is the time index in, in our notation because it goes from one to T, yeah? So this is the time dimension and this is the stock dimension. J is the stock dimension and I is the time dimension. So it subtracts for this first element, when J is one, I is one, the risk-free rate from the gross return matrix and puts it into, and this element is put into this Y1 matrix. So here's now the excess return for, I don't know, whatever it is, 0.8, something like that, for the first stock. And it completes the inner loop first before it goes to J is two. So next what it does is, okay, Next, J is one, I is two. What happens here? Same index we have here for the gross return matrix. So it grabs the corresponding element from the gross return matrix and subtracts the risk-free rate at I is two. 
obviously the risk rate has, has no uh, index J yeah, because it's always the same for all stocks. So it goes to the second element of the gross return matrix Y and subtracts the corresponding risk free rate at time T is 2 and puts it into the Y1 matrix. Yeah. So and, and so it, it does for all points in time until I is equal to T and if this loop is completed it goes to the to the other loop again and does the same for the second stock, then J is 2. And in, in the second column, we have the second stock. And again, it grabs the corresponding gross return from the Y matrix, so subtracts the corresponding risk-free risk -free rate because then um, if J is 2, it starts again for I is 1. Yeah? So we are again here, grabs the gross return or the corresponding gross return matrix and then it, it subtracts the risk-free rate and puts it here. And again, it, it, it completes everything until capital T and then it goes to the next. So this is what happens here. And of course, Meta does it in a split second. So that's what we do. Or well, that's basically what, what this code here is doing. Uh, and I told you earlier, what you, the main point that you should learn in this course is how to operate with the for loop because you can do basically anything with the for loop if you want, well, at least most things. This is theater, everybody. Yeah. And of course, you know, like in every language, you can express the same thing using a different sentence. Yeah. I learned in Finnish you can say meet a kolo or you can say meet a mene. And people understand it's actually the same thing. Right? It's similar like here. So what you can do here instead is you can define y1, zeros, what, what do we have here? T dot comma k. Then we have this for loop here for j is 1 to capital K and then we can say all right y1 double double point comma j is equal to y double point comma j minus rf so what's going on here so i told you if we write this double point it tells me that it should take the whole column the only thing that is now that has a running index is the column is the, is the column index here so it it, it now tells tells me that okay put something into the whole first column here of our y one matrix. And what should be put in there? It should grab the corresponding column in the gross return matrix, which have we denoted as Y, and subtract from the whole column the vector of interest rates, or of risk-free rates. Yeah. So now it puts in, it, it only uses one, one for loop because we subtract for each column vector of gross returns, the corresponding uh, vector of um, interest rate, of, of the risk free rate, and, and store it in the whole column at the same time. We can do that, of course, because the dimension the, we have in our gross return matrix, as many rows as we have uh, as, as our um, interest rate vector has. So this is 215 times 1. And, our, and, the, and the dimension of each column vector in our y, y matrix is also 250 by 1, by construction. By construction. That's why we can do that. And then we would just end our first for loop, and what comes out is we have stored in our workspace our excess, our excess return matrix here. Yeah? This is also how, one way to do that. We can do it step by step, 
using four, two for loops or we can do it just with one for loop. I made it just here with, with two for loops because just to show you how it works out. So then we can, we have to continue. We want to have the vector of excess returns because our cap M, our asset pricing model, or our pricing model is defined in terms of excess returns. So we use excess stock returns and we use the excess market returns. So how, how do we proceed? We do basically the same thing. Let's move this away here. So it's, first of all, we define a vector of zero. This is always how we start. So we have to store, if we want to store something, we have to first define a vector or a matrix of, of zeros where we, where we plug in successively the elements that we are interested in, okay? So in, in this case, we say, okay, give me a vector, let's call it x1 in this case. In x1, then we want to store now the excess market returns. So, and this is a vector of zeros and it should have the dimension t and one. And this means, okay, it's a column vector, 215 by one. So if we would write, if we would change here, if we would write one comma t, then it's a row vector, yeah? Then we would have this guy here. A vector that has uh, one row and 215 columns. So this is a row vector, this is a column vector. Yeah? But in, in our example, we have a column vector and this is this, this guy here on, on this side. Yeah? And actually it doesn't matter because we can always transpose this guy and then it becomes a, the column vector becomes the row vector and, and vice versa. So actually it doesn't really matter. But in this case here, what we do is, okay, we construct a vector of zeros, 215 rows and, and one column. And for each, for i is one to t, so this is t, and we start here at i is 1 until i is t. So this is the first iteration. Here, here we have the last iteration. So for the first iteration, the first element here, x1i1, should be xi. And then x, we have defined our gross returns of the stock index. So we take the first gross return if i is 1 and subtract minus rfi. So there, it's, it's the same index and the same dimension. So we subtract the, the first element from the gross return. So from the first, so the, from, from the gross return at time t is one, we subtract the corresponding risk-free rate at time t is one. This is what happens here. And then we put it into this x1 vector that we constructed. Yeah? So this is then after the first iteration, we have here a figure, it's maybe 0.7 or something, I don't know, whatever. Yeah? And then it goes to i is 2 and until everything is completed. And now we, re we remember, because we made our homework, what we also can do is we can simply define x1 is x, yeah? the gross returns the vector of gross returns of our omix 30 minus the risk-free rate. That's it. So this is exactly, this will give you exactly the same like there. Because this is a 215 by one vector and our gross returns are also 215 by one vector. So we, so we can do this uh, vector operation. We can just subtract the risk-free rate vector from the gross return vector. And what we get is the excess return vector, x1. So instead of using the for loop, of course, it's probably easier to do it like that.
is a steer to everybody. I think it's no big deal, right? That's, that's basically the logic behind that, so it's uh, nothing uh, magic that happens here. It's still, still simple. So what happens then? So we construct again, we wanted to store, now we have to remember, we wanted to store the betas for each of the stocks in a result vector. And the result vector we call it here beta. Yeah? Very simple, just what happens here. So give me, construct me, or give me a, a vector of zeros. Beta should be, so zeros 14 by one, we could also write, because we have al al already defined that k, or well, that k is 14, so we could also write zeros, and then in parentheses k comma one. Yeah? Or, or we can just write what, what k is, and this is 14, because we have 14 stocks in our stock universe, right? So now, what, what we do now is we construct again a column vector, right? Is it a column vector? Yes, it is. So we construct a column vector that has 14 elements, yeah? 14 by one column vector. So, and, what's, and what happens here? So we start, so I, I goes from one to K, and remember, okay, that's again our stock K is our stock dimension, respectively I. So we start here, so what should be what should we put in here? The first element in our beta zero vector, okay? This first element, so beta, if i is one, so beta one should be, what do we have here? So x one prime times itself, so x one prime, the star means times, you, you multiply something, times itself, and this means take the inverse, or this means actually to the power of something, but then you write this guy minus one means take the inverse times x1, this is again our regressor here, prime times y1, take the whole column one. So what happens here? So we are multiplying here something and we know that x1, this vector x, x1 is simply our regressor matrix in this very simple case, and it's just a vector of excess returns, of, of excess market returns. Huh? Times itself inverted, times itself transposed, times y1. So what is, in, what is in the first column of our y1 matrix? So this means, this command means, okay, take, take from this y1 matrix the whole first column, because J is one, this is our column index, and double point means take, take all rows. So that's, that's a column vector and it corresponds to the first columns of our Y1. And in Y1, what have we stored in Y1? In, in Y1, in the first column, we have the excess return of our first stock, right? This is a, this guy here, it's a simple t by one vector, and it corresponds to the excess returns of the first stock. X1 is our regressor matrix. And now we have to go back to this here, to this whiteboard. About 32.5 minutes ago, we were deriving our point estimator using the OLS regression, right? So x prime x inverted, x prime y. 
That's the regressor matrix times itself inverted times the regressor matrix transposed times the y vector. The y vector is the, are the excess returns on our capital asset pricing model framework on our asset pricing framework in, in general. This guy here it denotes the excess returns of the stock and this is our asset pricing model. Yeah? In, the, in our very simple framework that's x1 and that's y1 like the first column of this y1 matrix where we have stored the excess returns of the stocks. So in the first iteration, it regresses the excess returns of the first stock on our excess market returns and puts the corresponding point estimator, which is in, in our case just the loading against the market factor because we just use the simple excess returns of the market factor as uh, regressors and stores them in our beta 1 vector, in our result vector, yeah? you remember. So the first element is now estimated. Is it, is it obvious to you? Can, you? can you see that this is actually exactly the same like the OLS formula? It's exactly the same. Just in MATLAB language. Yes? Why are we choosing only 14 rows instead of 215? Like in X1, there yeah, are yeah. 15 and 1. Yeah. But now there is uh, 14 and 1. If I understood right, it's 14 rows in the first column. Yeah. 1, 215. How many stocks do we have? Uh, about 14, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, we are basically storing, so we we doing this for. So I is now from from one to K. All right. So K yeah. K is our stock dimension, and we have now. Okay, actually we could we could also put in here J. Yeah. Then J is from one to K. So MATLAB remembers basically. Where you, where you put in this, this element here, this running index. Yeah? It doesn't matter if you, if you write here j is 1 to k and then put in j here. The, the main point is that it is here on the, on the right-hand side because that's the column index. So, or you could also write small k or, or, or maybe l is 1 to k and then write an l here. So that, that doesn't matter. What, what matters is actually that k is the, or that on, on the, on the right-hand side is the stock dimension. And so, this is a 215 by 1 vector. This is 1 by 215 because we transpose the excess returns. So what, what is here is 1 by 1. It's just a scalar. It's just a number times something that is 1 by 215 times something that is 215 by 1. So what comes here, this is also 1 by 1. So the whole expression is just a number, and this is nothing else but the loading against the market factor that, uh, that we get. So if we have completed that, it goes to i is 2. So what happens here? Everything here is the sa remains the same. But this changes here. What happens then? So now we remember our Y1 matrix. So the first guy we have already completed, yeah? But now we go, we jump to the second column, I is then two, and it means okay, give me and multiply this whole expression with, the, with what is in the second column of our excess return matrix. Yeah? So everything that changes is only here the last element, which means we regress the excess returns of the second stock on our regressor matrix. This is what happens when i is 2. Yeah? This is what you see here. So this re remains the same. So we, we regress the stocks successively 
on our asset pricing model and then store it in our beta vector that had zeros. So after the first iteration, the first guy here is a number, it's maybe, maybe it's 0.6, which is the sensitivity of the first stock against the market factor. And after the second iteration, we have a number here at the second position, it's maybe 0. Point, I don't know, maybe 0. 0.7, and so on and so forth. Until I is K, until we end up with the last stock here in our guess return matrix. So here would be then K is 14. And here the first element was when K, uh, when, when, sorry, when I when i is 1, and here, if i is k, which is equal to 14 in our example, yeah? <coughs> this is clear to everybody, what happens here. Exactly the same formula that we derived, but now we put it into MATLAB language here. Yeah? So the star means multiplying this means the transposed sign, and that's basically it. So after we have estimated the last point estimate, like the last sensitivity against the market factor of the 14th stock, the loop is completed. And what we could then do is we can write in MATLAB, First of all, we can write beta, and I told you whenever we do not write this uh, colon, then it would spit us out what it is. So after we have completed our operation here, we can just write beta in the workspace, or uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in, the, in the command window, and then we push the enter button, and then Meta would spit us out what beta is, what is, what is in this vector. And that's here, that's, what comes out if you have done everything correctly. So you should get a 14 by one vector, of course. Yeah? And what we have stored here are now the corresponding sensitivities of each stock against the market factor. Yeah? So the first element is 0 0.75, which means if the, if the excess returns of the OMX30 increase by, by one unit or by 1%, then this stock is increasing by about 0.75 percent. Yeah. What we could also do is we could plot our results or our vector in this case. Yeah. And that's the plot command. So what you then just, just do is you write plot of, in this case, beta and we know we have stored here all the elements here, so what happens then is MATLAB would give you the corresponding graph, which, which looks like that. This is the picture that you would get if you write plot beta and then push the enter button. It immediately spits out you the corresponding graph, and what you can also do is you could go on here, this, this is the save button, and then you could store basically your graph in, on your in your folder or whatever. And then, and then as JPEG, for instance, as JPEG file, then you could, or as PN something, and then you can copy it into your Word document or so, if you write a term paper or your master thesis. Yeah. You could also go and edit, then you, then you can insert table descriptions here on the Y axis and on the X, uh, on the Y axis and on the X axis here. Yeah, if you want, then you would maybe here write a number of stocks or something, and here you would write as table as table description for the y-axis. You would maybe write beta estimates or something like that. Yeah. This is this is what you can do. Just you know play around with that, then you might see. You, you can also highlight certain points here. There's there there's this highlighter here, which is uh, the, the the button directly on the desktop. There you can depict single elements here that you want to highlight in your graph and. Uh, so MATLAB offers different tools, you know, very similar to what you know from Excel already.
So is the first exercise clear to everybody? What happens here? So in the beginning it may be a little bit more, more demanding, or I don't know, depending on your pre-knowledge, but I, I told you everything builds upon each other, so in the end we put everything together, and the more you understand in the beginning, the less problems you will have later on. So it's as, as simple as that. Yeah. So, and by the way, before I forgot it, uh, because last time someone asked me here. So ob obviously I, I have uh, in this file, I have not, this, this uh, Moodle page, I have not, uh, not organized it 100%. Yeah. So obviously I have, uh, you have uh, an access to a term paper from 2016 or something, right? So, I mean now I just leave it there for you, or you, or you, or for anyone else. So that you uh, roughly have an idea of uh, how the term paper looked like and uh, similar. I mean, it will be, of course, not the same now because once I know that, that you know, that, that you have access to this file, I will, of course, not give you the same questions. But, of course, this is similar. So your, your term paper will be pretty much similar to that. It's like, like the same style. Yeah. So then you have a rough, rough idea what you can expect. You know. Yeah. So now it becomes interesting. So this is, this is just a warm up now. So what do we want to do now? So I, I told you so the, the, the purpose is actually, or it's, it's just a simple exercise for someone, okay, let's assume you're running a, in an investment fund and you want to allocate, you have a certain universe of stocks and you want to, you want to invest in only high beta stocks. Yeah? So you have to somehow so to determine where where in our stock universe are the high beta stocks. So the second task, as you can see here, sort the stocks into three groups. Now, if we have a huge stock universe, if we have 10,000 stocks, then we could also sort these stocks into maybe 10 groups. Yeah? Then we would have still a well diversified portfolio of about 1,000 stocks in each portfolio. So we have to ensure somehow that our portfolios are well diversified, but since our stock universe is very small here in our example exercise, so we just use three groups. Yeah? Sort, so sort the stocks in this universe into three groups. The first group contains 30% of the stocks having the lowest beta. The second group contains 40% of, of the stocks with a medium beta. And the last group, the third group, contains 30% of the stocks that have the highest beta. Yeah. And then also I give you a hint here in parentheses, if necessary, round down the number of stocks in each group. As an alternative, you could also round it up, of course, but in this case I say, okay, ro let's round the numbers down. Construct an equal weighted portfolio that contains the high beta group. Estimate the Sharpe ratio and compare it with the omics 30, which is our reference index. So of course, if you run a hedge fund or if you run any Investment strategy, you usually have benchmark yeah, as a reference. And in this case, because we have Swedish stocks, we use the OMIX 30. If you use Finnish stocks, you might use the OMIX 25 as a benchmark index. If we invest in US stocks, of course, then it's the S&P 500 or maybe the Dow Jones 30, depending on your portfolio. <coughs> so in the vector beta, we have stored the beta estimates of all of our stocks in our stock universe. Yeah? It's 14 by 1. So what we want to do now is we want to, in order to, in order to, to determine which of these stocks have actually the highest beta, we have to sort the betas in an increasing or decreasing order. So the easiest thing to do it in, in MATLAB is to use the sort command. So what happens here? We define a new vector. And we, in this simple example, I just call it beta sorted or beta underscore sorted. And it should be defined as sort beta. So the sort command 
sorts whatever it is here in parentheses, any vector yeah, is sorted in an increasing order from lowest to highest. So our lowest beta in our sample is obviously 0.33 and the highest beta of our stocks in our sample is 0.97. Yeah? If, if we go back now here, we can see it here. So on, in this position here, we have the highest beta stock, 0.97, and the lowest beta stock is on the fourth position here. Yeah? But after sorting, of course, the stock in the fourth position becomes the first because it has the lowest beta, and the stock that was here somewhere in the middle in the original beta vector is now the last after sorting. So, and we are interested basically in 30% of those stocks that have the highest beta. And they are, of course, here in our sorted beta vector. These are the stocks that we are interested in. And, but, and now let's, let's assume we have like 1,000 stocks then this becomes, of course, much more complicated, right? Yeah. Because we have to basically, let's say we have 10,000 stocks and we use decile sorts and we want to determine which of these, where are these 1,000 stocks among our 10,000 stocks that have the highest beta? And then this, this becomes fuzzy, right? Because this is then a 10,000 by one vector and then we have to depict those elements of this huge vector that has the, low, that, that has the highest uh, point estimates here. So, but if we use this uh, approach here, then it, we can do it for any size or for, for, for any stock universe. Yeah? So the, the question is now, or the challenge is now, okay, to determine where to find those high beta stocks. In, in our simple case, as I said, it, it's, it's still easy to do it visually, actually. But uh, once you have a bigger data, sem data sample, you have to do it using, using the for loops or doing, doing by coding, right? So that's basically, if you plot the beta sorted vector, it looks like that, like this graph here. Yeah? in an increasing order. So here's the lowest beta is here, 0.33 or something, and the highest beta stock has 0.97. So what happens here? C1 floor 0.3 times k. What does that mean? So first of all, Let's write here our beta sorted vector, which has 14 elements. So these are our 14, 14 elements in our beta sorted vector. First of all, we want to determine where is the, what is the last stock that is in this 30% Low, low beta stock group. What's the last stock here? So, re so you remember we have uh, a sorting where we have 30% of low beta stocks in the first group. We have the 40% of medium beta stock in the second group. And we have 30% of high beta stocks in the, in the last group. So that's the third group here. 
this is the first group and here we have the second group yeah. so but what should be the last guy here because we have to know that because in our beta sorted vector in this position here we will find the corresponding stock that has the highest beta in the low beta group and we also have to have to determine on which, which position is this guy here here we have cumulative it's 70 percent right so we have to determine also which stock is in this position here if we know that then we know also the corresponding value in this beta sorted vector that has or we know the, what is the highest beta in the medium beta group. Yeah? This is actually what, what this gives us later on. So we have 14 stocks. K is 14, but K, as I told you, K can also be 10,000 if, if we operate with bigger data sets. So if K is 10,000 and we want to have the 30% and the, and the last element and we would have 0.3 30% times k which is 10,000 then it, it would give us the, then c1 would be 3,000 right and c2 would be then in this case 7,000 it's the stock number 7,000 and floor means basically because it could be that our data sample is not balanced. It could be that our data sample has uh, an uneven number of stocks. Maybe we have just maybe we have 999 stocks, or like in our case, we have 14 stocks. So, and floor means that the command of give me the the corresponding natural number, and it's rounded down. So, if we have, for instance, Let's say floor of 4.7 is 4. And floor of 4.3 uh, is also 4. So this command floor means, okay, give me the first natural number here before the comma. Yeah. There's an alternative if we would round it up. There's the command which is called seal. So seal of 4.7 would be 5. And seal of 4.2 is also 5. So it gives you then the next um, real number here. Or nat natural number, right? It's nat actually the natural number. So floor of whatever is here in parentheses will give you the corresponding natural number before the comma. Yeah? So we round it down. So k is 14, o times, o, um, o comma 3 times 14 is 4.2, 4 so c1 will be then floor from 4.2 which is 4, so c1 is 4 in our case. So C1 is 4, and that means, okay, on, in the fourth position, we, we know now, in the fourth position here, in this beta sorted vector, we will find the corresponding um, sensitivity of the guy that, is in the, that has the highest beta in the first group, which is the low beta group. All, all beta estimates that are below this point estimate will end up in this group. So next, 
we have to determine which beta or where, where to find the beta, the highest beta in the second group. So, and the cumulative part is 70% because 30% are in the, for, in the first group, 40% in the second group. So if you sort it, we end up with 70%. So C2, we define as floor from 0.7 times K. K is 14. 0.7 times K is 9.8. And we round it down. Floor means round it down. So it gives us 9. The floor, C2 is floor from 9.8, which is 9. So now we we go back to our beta sorted vector and now we know okay on the position number nine here there will be the corresponding beta estimate of the last stock in the second group yeah So now we know where to find, basically, the corresponding market loadings in our beta sorted vector. It's on, the, it's on the position 4 and on the position 9. And this is defined in our code already as C1. And this is defined in our code as C2. Yeah. All right. So now we define C3. And C3 gives us now the corresponding market sensitivity here. It gives us the corresponding element here. Uh, C3 is defined, I, I need to put this away here. C3 is defined as beta sorted And on the fourth position, yeah, because C, C1 is 4, we know already. So this gives us the value, the corresponding sensitivity here. The beta, it's maybe, is, is it 0. Point, what was it in our, yeah, it's 0. 0.63 actually. Yeah, it's 0. 0.63. So all stocks that have a market sensitivity that is less or equal than 0. 0.63 they will end up in our first group, in the low beta group. And then we define C4, which should give us the value of the market sensitivity of the guy that is the last stock in the second group. And this will be beta underscore sorted of C2. Yeah. C2 is 9, so it gives us the corresponding element here in our beta sorted vector, the corresponding market, market sensitivity of the ninth stock in, the, in this increasing order. So let's see. So, and it, is, it has the value of 0.79 actually. So all stocks, yeah. So this guy is 0.79. So what we want to do now is we want to form three groups. Yeah? The first group contains, we want to identify in our excess returns matrix, where are those stocks that have a market sensitivity of equal or less to 0.63? Because these are the stocks that have a low beta in our sample. Then we want to identify those stocks that have a beta that is larger than 0.63 but smaller than 0.79. So these are the stocks that are in the medium group. They have a medium beta. And finally, in the third group, we want to identify where are the stocks in our excess return matrix that have a beta that is larger than 0.79. And these are the stocks that we want to buy.
is this, is this clear to everybody how this works out? Now, this is very general. Of course, you can run this for how many stocks do you ever want? Doesn't matter. It's, uh, you just upload the data, you push the enter button, and then it r gives you the estimates. So that's always what I would recommend you to do, to write the code as general as you can do. Now, so that you can just can upload any data set and you, you know, I've written when I was a doctoral student, so I was, uh, I took one, one course in econometrics, and it was actually for master students and for doctoral students. Often courses are together with master students, and then you have to do a little, like a term paper or something, if you're a doctoral student. So I was uh, taking one course, and uh, then we are supposed to write a term paper, and then, then we are supposed to use some of these methods that he went through in his lectures, and then I wrote a code for, um, it's called volatility spillover indices. Uh, it, it gives you basically, um, it, it gives you the, the, the dynamics between different uh, stochastic processes, for instance, the volatilities of, uh, of, of stocks and bonds, let's say, or, or stocks and currencies or, or whatever. And it gives you basically um, a graph where you can read, okay, where, where, where this volatility is co-moving, or, or where, where was the co-movement high and where was it low. So it, it can give you, it gives you some information about the stochastic interdependence in, in the system. So if you run this, for instance, in the, mm. what you can see is, for instance, the dollar factor and the carry, carry risk factor are actually orthogonal. So they are uh, un, un, uncorrelated in the first moment. But there is, a, whenever there is stress in the economy, for instance, during the financial crisis period, they were co-moving. The risk was co-moving between this, these two factors. And this is usually what you see. Uh, when, when the market is under stress, then there is a high co-movement in the uncertainty in the markets. And when the risk, and when uh, the stress disappears and everything is all right in the economy, then usually the volatilities go their own paths. So there's, uh, there are some, uh, some dynamics going on. But well, I, I wrote this code. It was very general also, and I have already done like many research projects with the same thing. Yeah. So I use the same thing over and over again. So, and that's actually also how it works out here. So I mean, once you have written your code, for instance, I will provide you a code for momentum sorts. I used the code for, uh, by myself many times already. So, and you can do many research uh, you can basically um, process or deal with many research projects using the same code, yeah? using a different data set. So that's, that's usually how it, how it works. So you have to work only like very hard only once and then you get the payoff afterwards. That's called delayed gratification. Yeah. You know, there, some people, they are impulsive, you know? They, they want to have the immediate gratification. Yeah. For instance, if you eat candies or something, it gives you like, it makes you feeling good. You get dopamine and so on and so forth. But in the long term, it might be not so good for you. Yeah. But there, and there are also people who can delay gratification. Yeah. So they know, okay, if I invest now my time into something, I will get the payoff in a, in a later period, and the payoff might be much bigger compared to getting immediate pleasure of, from something. Yeah. Delayed gratification. It's an important concept of life. So, but let's go back to business here. Yeah. So what happens now, I told you. First of all, we want to determine those stocks that are in this low beta group. This is what happens here. So group one, again, we define a vector. This time we deal with the row vector, obviously. Uh, group one is defined as zeros, zeros one by k, k is 14, so it's a, vector of zeros that we here create, basically. And now we want to plug in something here. 
So for i is 1 to k, k is the stock dimension. And now what happens here is we want to determine where in our excess return matrix are those stocks located that have a beta that is smaller than 0.63. Because in this first group, we want to store, we want to basically indicate where to find those stocks in the exact return matrix. So what we create here, group one, is a dummy vector. It has only zeros and ones. One, whenever this is fulfilled, whenever the beta is smaller or equal to 0.63 and a zero otherwise. So it's an indicating vector, an in indicator vector. So if beta i, so in, in beta i, yeah, we know we have stored the market sensitivity of all the stocks, but in the same order as in the exact return matrix. We, we remember in, in beta sorted, we have sorted the betas in increasing order, but in the beta vector, we have, this, we have the betas in exactly the same position for each single stock that we have in our excess return matrix. So this is now, in, we, have, we um, have now here the if command. So first of all, we, we go through the each element. So we, so we start here with well, the first element here. What should we put in? This is, this is our group vector, our group one vector here that we, that we just con constructed. It has zeros everywhere. So, but now we go step by step. And what do we put in here? The first element, i is now one. If beta i, and i is now one, if beta i is smaller or equal to c3, and c3, as we see there, is 0.63. It is the beta, it's the highest beta of the low beta group. Yeah? So, Here we have beta 14. Let's, let's note this as our beta vector. Yeah? It checks now for the first element if i is 1. Is the first element larger? Sorry, here. Is, is, is the first element beta 1, is it larger? or equal to, no, it's smaller, sorry. It's, it's a smaller, of course, because we want to have the stocks that have a lower beta. So is, is the first element, now i is 1, so it's beta 1 that matters. Is beta 1 smaller or equal to 0 point, 0 point 0.63? If yes, put in here a 1, in the first element of, the, of this group one vector, else leave, leave it or just put in a zero. So leave it as it is. So if the first element here, let's go back. What was the first element in our beta vector? So the first element was 0.75. So 0.75 is bigger than 0.63. So here the first element will remain a zero. So then it goes to the second element here. Then i is two. And it does the same thing. It checks if the second beta of our second stock, like the market sensitivity of, of our second stock, is it smaller or equal to 0.63? Yes or no? If yes, then it's a part of this low beta group and it gets the one here. If no, we leave it as a zero. Second element is 0 0.80, 0 0.85. So obviously it's larger than 0 0.63. So it, it remains zero as well. Third element as well, but the fourth element will get a one because 0 points, the, fourth, the fourth stock has a beta that is smaller then 0.63, so the fourth element here will get a 1. 
and then continues. Then I is 5. Fifth element is 0.67. 0.67 is obviously bigger than 0.63, so it gets a zero here as well. And so on and so forth. Yeah? Until it was going through all the all the betas of all of, of all of our stocks in our excess return matrix. Yeah? Is this clear to everybody? So this group one vector consists of zeros and ones, as you see here, and it gives us the positions. So whenever there's a one, there's the position of the corresponding stock in our excess return matrix that, is, that has dimension of 215 by 14. Yeah? And here also, this vector has a dimension of 1 by 14. Yeah? So then it gives us, in, the, in, in each of these, mm, for instance, the fourth stock and the seventh stock and the ninth stock and the tenth stock, obviously. Those are the stocks that have the lowest beta or that are in the low beta group. Yeah, so we can read. Here already the position, where are the stocks located that have the lowest beta? So in the same manner, we want to determine now where are the stocks that have a medium beta in the medium beta group. So we again, we define a group two vector. I call it group two. You can call it, of course, however you want. Yeah. It's again a vector of, of uh, dimension one by k. So that's a row vector that has 14 elements. And now it does a similar thing, but re re remember now, we want to have now those stocks, if we now go back to our beta vector. So we want to figure out where are the stocks in our original beta vector that have a market sensitivity of higher than 0.63, but lower than 0.73. Nine, yeah. So, our condition is obviously different here. So it goes now. It, it asks now. Okay, if i is one, is is beta one? Is it really larger <coughs> than 0.63? as C3 is 0.63, right, as you see there. And this means both conditions have to be satisfied. Now, this, is the, this is the command in MATLAB that means, okay, both conditions need to be satisfied. At the same time, it asks, is this beta 1 smaller or equal to 0. 79, which is our C4, right? So both conditions need to be satisfied. So if both conditions are fulfilled, it should get a 1 here. If not, it remains a 0. And it does so for all stocks from I is 1 to K. Yeah? So it, again, this code goes through our beta vector that we have estimated here in the, in the, in the early beginning and checks for what or for, for which of these uh, beta estimates are both conditions fulfilled. And there are the stocks located in our exact return matrix that, have, that end up in the group three in the medium beta group. This is what happens here. And this is how the vector looks like. Yeah? And of course, we have here the really larger sign, yeah? because we remember earlier we had, in the, for the group one, we had this sign, smaller or equal. 
if we had smaller or equal first, it must be, the second condition must be really larger. Yeah. Otherwise, the same stock might end up in, in both groups. And, this is, and, we, and we don't want that. If we later on add all of these group vectors together, it should be a vector of ones. So each stock should, be, should only end up in one group. Otherwise, the portfolios get polluted. Right? So finally, we create the last group vector. So again, we ask uh, MATLAB to give us a vector of zeros that has uh, one row and 14 columns. So it's a row vector. And now the condition is, we, we go again from i is 1 to k, and capital K is our soft dimension. So we ask, okay, if i is 1, is beta 1 larger, really larger than 0.79, which we define as our C4 here. Yeah? C4 is 0.79. So is B1 really larger than 0.79? If it is, it's obviously a candidate of our high beta group, and then it gets a 1. Otherwise, it should get a 0. So again, we basically what, what the code is doing here, it goes through the beta vector step by step and checks each of these elements if they are larger than 0.79, which, is the, which gives us the beta loading of the last stock in the second group. Yeah? And now imagine you have 10,000 stocks, so it's a lot of work. So, but it takes for MATLAB just a split second. So that's then, here I have plotted you how this vector looks like. Yeah? So on the, obviously the second, the third stock, four, five, the sixth stock, the eighth stock, and the last stock, the 14th stock, they are the stocks on our sample that actually have the highest beta. Yeah. And group three, as an alternative, we can also, for those of you who paid some attention to what I told you in the early beginning. So we know that group one, two, and three, they should end up to one. It should be a vector of ones if you add them up. So what you could, could do instead is you could write all right, because you know that, you define group three as, so ones, this means Give me a vector that has 14 ones. It's a 1 by 14 vector. And subtract minus group 1 minus group 2. So what, it, what this code does here, this, it's just one line. It subtracts from a vector, of, from a row vector that has only ones. It subtracts group one and group two. And what you would get is exactly the same that we have coded here in the, in the third um, for loop here. That's the shortcut, that's the easy way. Yeah. It's obvious, right? So then we have uh, two minutes, three minutes left. Before I finish here, the RFM exam is closed, right? 
Mm -hmm. So, for the I told you already uh, that in the in the, in the first uh, e exam I will I don't know who of you wants to take the first exam. Okay. You too. Ah. So in, I told you in the first exam the the stumble paper will be most important. So get familiar with, with that paper, how to set up the hypothesis, and uh, how, to, how to test. So I, I, did, it, I did it with you in the, in the exercise sessions and also during the lecture. So this will be, of course, this will be um, important for the first exam. So get familiar with that and then you will probably doing well, I guess. But I think about how they develop the hypothesis. Think about how they develop the hypothesis. Yeah. So otherwise, uh, we will do then the rest of this code and uh, the rest of this script here next time. I think it's a good, it's a good point to stop here. Mm -hmm.